Let's go to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. A lot of good stuff there. We're going to read where the apostle gets bitten by a serpent, a venomous beast, a viper, it says. There's no doubt it bit him. <laughs> so let's take a look at this thing. <clears throat> All right, beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 28. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when they should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after that he had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him. Uh, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Boy, people are fickle, aren't they? Boy, I tore up that rendering. But anyway, that we are reading from the King James. Amen. Not the dyslexic Sam Morris. Anyway, Paul was a faithful witness of the life-changing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. From the day that Paul met the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road until he gave his life for the Lord in Rome, he was a mighty preacher of the gospel of grace. Amen. Now, here in this passage, we find him on his way to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. And Paul would spend years as a prisoner in Rome and he would eventually lay down his life as a faithful martyr of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 27, prior to our rendering of the King James that we so pitifully handled, Paul and his companions are caught up in a storm and uh, everyone on the ship um, had supposed they were going to die. That's how bad it was. Everyone that is Paul, because the Lord sent an angel to comfort Paul and tell him that the ship would be lost, but all the lives on the ship would be spared. Amen. Now that's interesting. And of course, Paul tells him that, well, the ship's going to be lost, but we're all going to live. Well, the ship was definitely lost in the storm, but all those on board, they definitely made it to shore safely, just like the Lord said. Anyway, so Paul and his shipmates become marooned on an island called Melita. Uh, it's a little island that's located in the Mediterranean Sea between Sicily and Africa. And it's called Malta today, if you want to look at it on a map. So anyway, when the survivors landed on the island, they're met by some very friendly natives. Boy, that's always a good thing that they're not cannibals or something. But verse 2 of our text tells us that the inhabitants of Melita were quick to offer aid and to comfort Paul and the others. And there was 276 of them on board. That was a big task. But anyway, so Paul starts helping to gather wood for the fire. Amen. Unlike the doctors and uh, theologians of our day that everyone gathers fire for them or wood for them. He's out there working alongside as he should be. And he's gathering this wood. And as he lays a bundle of sticks in the flames, a viper comes out of the wood and bites Paul, hangs on to his hand. And apparently the snake was probably lethargic due to the cold and rain. I've seen that before in the Mojave Desert. Uh, at night it gets real cold and they have this, this rattlesnake out there. Uh, well, several kinds. And boy, they'll come up on you if you build a fire because they're trying to seek heat. Uh, but anyway, it's funny why they're cold. They go to rattle and they can barely rattle or move or strike. You can just reach down and put your hand on their head. They can't bite you because they're so slow. Uh, but then they get near the fire and they tend to come to life again. So you have to be careful of that. But anyway, uh, this viper comes out, it's hanging on him. And, and uh, we believe he's, he's revived because he was near the fire. Now there's two thoughts here that I have with that. Number one, if you warm your sin, it'll always bite you. That's a good thought. If you warm your sin, it'll always bite you. But today's message I want to say is this. As you keep your heart on fire... In a cold world, 
there will be snakes that bite. As you keep your heart on fire in a cold world, there will be snakes that bite. So anyway, Paul shook the snake off and the people waited to see what would happen to him. So he had a real trial there, wouldn't you say? He was bitten by a venomous snake. But God in His mercy fulfilled the promise of Mark 16, 18, where He said they'll take up serpents and not be harmed. And He spared Paul's life. That viper was a problem, but Paul faced, I believe, some far more deadly snakes that night. Snakes that had the power to ruin his life and even end his ministry. He shook off every single one of them. I want to point out the snakes that Paul faced on Melita that night. And I want to encourage you to recognize the snakes that can latch onto your life. And I want to preach the idea of shaking off snakes. Now this is, I, I don't think this is by any means an original message. I, I've preached this one time before. And you're not going to believe this, but it was 13 years ago. I preached this message. I'm sure y'all remember that. Uh, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit offended. Anyway, uh, I don't know that this is original with me. So if, if somebody researches and finds this online somewhere, well, I'm just going to tell you, uh, probably, it was probably such a good message I used it, but I always make them my own somehow. Anyway, there's three snakes that he had to shake off besides the venomous viper that bit him. And those are three snakes that you and I have to shake off that bite us in our cold world today as we try to keep our hearts warm for God. Anyway, the first one that he shook off was the snake of crisis. The snake of crisis. Anybody have a crisis in their life recently? Yeah, it seems like 20... Uh, 18, 2017 until now has been nothing but crisis after crisis in our little church and in our family. But there in verse 3 it says, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat fastened on his hand. So here he was, he was bitten. And that's a real crisis when a rattlesnake or some other kind of viper gets a hold of your hand. Now that snake was venomous and could have claimed Paul's life right there that very moment. Now, of course, we know God took care of the venom, but here's the problem. The crisis came when Paul was doing good. Always remember that. The crisis came when Paul was doing good. Now, after the episode on the ship where he saved everyone's life, he probably could have demanded special treatment, but he's out there working and serving. Still, a time of crisis came into his life. I don't know why it is, but we as Christians sometimes think that our faithful service to the Lord is some kind of a shield against trouble in our lives. Absolutely not. That is just no. Not so. Amen? I mean, if we ask Job, he'd say the same thing. What, matter of fact, uh, the devil was allowed to unleash in his life and God said that he was a righteous man that eschewed evil. When you think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were serving God at the height, I mean, serving God. And then now they're cast into a fiery furnace. Daniel, at the height of his service, cast into a lion's den. Elijah, chased for his very life. You think about the disciples, every one of them we named in the martyr's mirror as we present that book in our services. And even the Lord Jesus Christ, who went about doing good, always suffered crisis, the crisis of persecution and the cross. Can I tell you that troubles are a part of everyone's life? Job 14.1 says, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. John 16, 33, Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. We, we seem to think, now why am I going through this crisis? I mean, after all, 
Lord, I, I preach the gospel, I study the Bible, I, I don't kick the dog, I come home at night, I'm kind to my boss, I don't steal from anybody, I preach the gospel out on the street, I go to Africa, I go, you know, and all these things. And then trouble hits your life. Can I tell you? The trouble hits your life because of those things. Not in spite of those things. But boy, I tell you, sometimes in my life when trouble has come along, it it's derailed me a little bit. I'm sure some of y'all are in the same boat. Yep. Sometimes we feel like God's holding out on us and we feel that we deserve better treatment than what we're getting. I guess what we need to do in a time of crisis is do like Paul and put your faith in the promises of the Lord and believe Him for the help you need. See, in our times of trouble, we have some very precious promises. Did you know, according to Hebrews 13, 5, we have the promise of His presence? Did you know, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 57, we have the promise of His victory? Did you know, according to Romans 8, 28, we have the promise of His purpose in our life? According to 2 Corinthians 4, 17, we have the promise of His, He has a plan for our life. According to Ephesians 3, 20, we have the promise of His power in our life. I want to tell you something we've seen in the Bible. We serve a God who is our Father. And according to the witness of the Scriptures, He has moved heaven and earth to meet the need. I mean, you want the sun to stand still? He did that a couple times. Want the waters to cease? He did that, no problem. Had a rock of water which followed uh, the nation of Israel through the dry desert. He can do anything He wants. I mean, you think about Elijah and all the miracles surrounding his life with the altar of fire and, and so on. You think of Joshua, Moses, the disciples, uh, the widows. How he took care of widows. Mary and Martha, Jairus, his daughter. And then people we know, contemporaries like George Mueller, who would not have anything to feed anybody in his orphanage in England. And he would just get out by the road and pray that God would provide breakfast. And one time a milk truck broke down and gave him all milk for breakfast uh, uh, because he was praying. Amen. There's countless others. What I'm trying to tell you is the crisis is going to hit, but Paul didn't just lay down and die. See, you know what he did? He shook it off. He shook off the snake. Shake it off. Shake it off. Amen. Easier said than done, I know. And in my life, I've not shaken them off so quick, and that's cost me. Shake them off. Amen. So we see a snake that can latch on to your life is the snake of crisis. Well, let's move on. The second one we find in verse 4, and it'll be the snake of criticism. Criticism. Verse 4 says, And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped to see, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. As soon as Paul's bitten by the snake, these people begin to criticize him. Isn't that interesting? You know, church people will do that. Instead of trying to help a brother, they'll criticize him. Now, these people, of course, they're heathen, barbarous. So they were suspicious people and they assumed that the viper bit Paul because of some evil in his life. It's barbarous for us to always think that because someone's getting criticized or someone's uh, in a crisis that it's because of something they've done. That's really not our business, is it? But boy, that viper got on there, got a hold of him. See, in their view, he was being punished because he was a wicked man. And they figured that Neptune, the god of the sea, hadn't taken him. So now, uh, Nemesis, the goddess in charge of dispensing justice, would take him. Amen? That's the way they looked at it. I tell you, people are so quick to criticize when they don't understand what they see and hear. Some of us have been the object of criticism of others. I'm going to tell you something. We're not alone. All of us will face the snake of criticism. It will latch on to us. Some of the greatest people who ever lived have been criticized by others. Israel criticized Moses for everything that went wrong. They murmured when they were hungry. They whined and murmured when they were tired. And, and every other time of every other event, even Jesus faced criticism from His enemies. Did you know that He was called a blasphemer 
in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 3. He was even accused of being in a league with Satan in Matthew 9 and verse 34. We're going to get criticized like that. People are going to think we're doing the devil's work because we street preach and because we go about doing good. And then a viper is going to latch on to us. Shake it off. If you're not careful, the criticism you face from others will cause you to become defeated. It'll cause you to start to believe it or say, what's it worth? There's times when you and I deserve the criticism we receive. Let's be honest about that. There's times when we're wrong and we need to be shown our errors. But then there's other times when we're trying to do our very best and still we get criticized, misunderstood, misrepresented. Folks, if we're not careful, criticism will make us want to give up and quit. You know, Moses, if you read Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 through 14, he wanted to quit. There are people who pride themselves on their candor and it degenerates into brutality. Uh, I don't like to hear these people that say something like, I pride myself in speaking my mind. That's my talent. And I'm thinking, though, it's your talent. Then uh, borrowing the words of John Wesley, he said one time, the Lord wouldn't mind if you buried that talent. That's one talent you can bury. We should weigh our words carefully before we place the burden of them on someone else. So what do we do? What do you do in the face of criticism? I mean, if you're Moses or Joshua, what do you do? You continue to lead the people faithfully. You just keep going. If you're Jesus, you go to the cross and you die for your critics. Always consider the source of the criticism, by the way. Some people deserve to be listened to. Others do not. If you're wise, you'll get your eyes off the critics and focus them on the Lord Jesus instead. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Keep your eye on Him and shake off that snake. Shake it off. Move on by the power of the Spirit of God when your critics try to latch on to you and kill you. Amen? Amen. So we see Paul face three snakes that night that definitely could have killed him uh, just as deadly as the venomous beast that latched onto his hand. And the first one was the snake of crisis. The second was the snake of criticism. But the third we find in verse 6. And I'm telling you tonight or today, let's shake off the snake of cynicism. Cynicism. Verse 6 is, How be it they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> These people were sitting there watching Paul, waiting for him to swell up, fall down, and die. And they expected a great fall from the apostle. They were a cynical crowd that looked for nothing good to come of this situation. How many people in this room have been the object of some cynic's words? Oh, you'll never make it. This church thing won't last. You're going to fail. You're going to give up on this. This isn't real. You're going to fall. Some people are just waiting for you to fail. I mean, if you're not careful, the prophecy of the cynic can become self-fulfilling. But you make a mistake and you say, Where's the, what's the use? I might as well quit. Can I tell you, the cynics don't have the last word. You do. Shake off the viper of cynicism and prove the doubters wrong by your faithful obedience to the Lord. And by the way, this is all about His glory. It's not about proving anything. But when you shake off that snake and you turn to the Word of God and believe His promises, you will show the doubters, the, the, the naysayers. Amen. David... You know, when he went out before he fought Goliath, his brother said he was too insignificant. Go, go what are you doing out here? Go, go back to that little flock that you've got. You're a nobody. Saul looked at him and said, you're too young, man. You cannot go out and face. Saul should have been out there facing that giant. Saul was the biggest man in Israel. 
What about David's brother, captain of the army? He should have been out there facing that giant. But no, little David did. They said he was too, too young, too insignificant. And David looked past those victories, uh, and, or I'm sorry, David looked uh, to past victories and knew God would deliver based on his promises. You know, when you hit a crisis or a cynic, or anything like that in criticism, you got to realize, well, wait a second, God's pulled me out of something like this before. And He'll do it again. Remember, He's our eternal Father, as we found out this morning. Amen? With an eternal spirit, an eternal son, eternal Bible, and eternal life. Amen? He'll always be there for us. His promises never go away. He always knows what He's talking about. Amen? What about the Lord Jesus? The Jews, even the Jews did not believe in Him. He came into His own and His own received Him not. Even His own family did not believe in Him. But you know what He did? He kept going until it is finished. And when it was all finished and He died and was buried, He still got up and went again. Shake off the snake. You know, I don't think anybody but you determines the quality and length of your service to the Lord. Not a critic. Not a cynic. Not a crisis. Those will all drive you from Him. Those will all latch on you and try to kill you. But that's only if you allow it. Greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. You can shake off that snake. You are given that ability as a child of God when you are given the new power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You can shake off the snake. So you got to ask, or I've got to ask you, are vipers attaching themselves to your life? In the 1968 Mexico City Olympics, There was a guy from Tanzania, a, a, a runner, and he finished 36th in the Olympic, whatever that was, marathon, whatever. When they interviewed him, they said, and, and when he finished, uh, it, was, it was heroic. I mean, he cramps, dried up. He should have just fallen out of the race. And here's something he said. Why? Why didn't you just quit when, it, when you knew you had it lost? You knew you had it lost. And he said, I was not sent here to start. I was sent here to finish. Amen. He was representing his country. And Paul, folks, that viper clung to him that night. And these three spiritual vipers that we're talking about all clung to him that night. He shook them off and he was still yet to pin the words, I have finished my course. Folks, we can shake it off. I'm going to tell you uh, as of late, some of the things that have gone on in our body are very discouraging. People all finding fault and it's like just latching on somehow as we try to serve God. But I'm telling you, we can shake it off and move on. Amen. There's some things we can't just do anything about and that's all there is to it. And we can just pick up and go on. Shake off the snake. Don't, don't let crisis, criticism, or, or cynicism Stop you from doing what God's called you to do. Amen? Amen. All right. That wasn't a very long one, but hopefully it was encouraging. Amen? Amen.